So what we're doing uh, today is we're going to finish off energy. Okay. So we're going to talk about three topics, and the class divides into two halves. So I don't know how it's going to go down. I'm very excited to see what's going to happen. It's sort of the highlight of my day to see how this shakes out. It's all downhill after that. So here we go. So there's three topics to cover on energy. You haven't covered one is power. Right. We have to talk about power because all the fun homework questions are about power. So it's really, in plain spoken words, how quickly, man, the quality of chalk is just, oh, how quickly energy is transferred. And I'm being vague there because it means a lot of different kinds of transfer. But you'll see, you know it when you see it or whatever that, however that goes. Energy is transferred. It's just the rate of change of energy from one state um, to another. In joules is energy per second or watts, which is in big W. Okay? So there you go. There's the unit. There's the hard part. So if it's how energy changes per unit time, then of course it's just the delta E, the change in energy over delta T. The change in energy in some time. Or if you're talking about a specific process, what do we use? What do we do to something to change its energy? We do work. So you could also write it this way for a lot of problems. It's the work that you do, the external work you do on something over delta T. The external work can be negative. It can be how, what, with what power do you absorb energy from a system? But that's really all it is. So in, in your mind, it's not really that complicated. So let's do a quick calculation. Let's see, we have a quick one, and then we have a not-so-quick one. Let's do a quick one just to get it in your head how to use uh, this formula. Let's push, and I was going to say a block, but I forgot to get a block. So we're going to push a book against um, friction at constant velocity. We've done that many times at this point. We do it over and over. I don't even have a book. Where'd the book go? Uh, well, I guess I could have got a block, but I got the book. I found this book here when I came in. It's the one Dr. Stinson used. It's from the uh, Harvard Classics five-foot shelf of books. Okay? So if you ever think the adult world is intelligent, and scary, and you're nervous about entering it, and we're all very serious, we're not. We're ridiculous, like egomaniacs, that we would own a book that is only about making your bookshelf five feet long. Okay? That's why it's, it literally says that. That's what's valuable about this book, is it will make you look smart, because it says Harvard Classics for five feet on your bookshelf. That's what we care about. Okay, so here it is. I'm going to push it at constant velocity. We've thought about the work I'm doing, but now let's think about the power. Here we go. Think about the power. Here it is. Do, 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 do. Oh, here's the book. I've got to draw it differently. There we go. Ooh, there's an eye. Oh, my God. He has the five foot bookshelf from Harvard. Wow. FP. Okay. And now we're pushing it at constant velocity. And we actually don't care how far we push it. Before we would say, oh, let's push it from zero to D and think about the work that we did. We could do that. Let's first think about the work. What was the work? If we push it from uh, zero to D, constant velocity, or a constant force, well, both, uh, what we did, we said, well, let's just draw the vector from zero to D. That's like the displacement vector. And we said, oh, the work is just the dot product of those two. Remember, if you have two vectors, you need to multiply them and get a scalar, you dot them, right? F dot D, or magnitude F times magnitude D times a cosine between them. Yada, yada, yada. But you could also ask, while I'm pushing that, how much work am I doing per unit time? What is the power of the push? What? Of the push. It is dumping energy somewhere. It's not speeding up the book, but it's going into what you heard about Tuesday, but into friction. So you're at, some, at some power, you're heating up the book and the table because you're generating, or you're pushing and making friction, or you're pushing against friction. So you just take that definition. P is the work over delta T. All right. And you say, what is the work? Oh, it's F dot D. F dot D over delta T. And then you say, does anything in here look like something in here? All right. So you say like that. And you say, oh, look at this. The displacement per time, that's just V. 
Okay, so the quick way to do these problems is to realize it's just f dot v. That's all you really need. Right, so the power is f dot v for if you have a constant force. And that's how a lot of the problems are solved. So in this, this one, we said if we pushed it at some velocity with some force, what's the power? Just multiply them if they're in the same direction. Let's do a problem where they're not in the same direction to illustrate sort of the vector nature. Right? You like to do problems up here. No, you like me to do problems up here. So I'm going to do one. You hate to do problems up here. All right. So let's do one real quick here. I'm going to even put in numbers. And it's even correct. When I did it last year, I had a mistake in there in the notes. So it was wrong last year. But this year, for you guys, it's actually probably correct. I'm going to push a two kilogram uh, block. But I'm not going to push straight. I'm going to push down at 45 degrees. Ooh. And it moves at 0 0.6 meters per second. Ah on a surface with a kinetic friction of 0.7. Ooh, how high. Right, it's got that rough faux leather surface, you know. So the question is, what is the force? What is F push? And uh, what is the power? So for what is F push, why don't you think about it on your own for 30 seconds while I draw my little diagram, but I'm going to stand in front of it. So just go off on your own there. See, think about how you would get F push. This is moving back into the beginning of the class, right? This isn't energy part yet. This is back, Y back. Mm, how would you do it? Let's see. Mm. Let's see. Hopefully you drew something like that. Right? Is that something roughly? That's not the free body diagram, but that's that's get you started. So the idea was, you know, a big part of these problems is interpreting what they mean. What I write on the board is kind of short. What we write on the exams is much longer and crystal clear. Right? So if I push down at 45 degrees, it does go forward, right? There we go. Oh, I don't want to rub the Harvard symbol off of it. Oh, no. OK. Um, so what we would do is say, if we want to think about that force, we've got to think about all the forces. We'd do a free body diagram. All right? So we'd say we apply um, F push like that. Right? And let's see, Mg, of course, is down like that. And there must be some normal force keeping it from flying through the table like that. And there must be some friction force back. Something like that. Not drawn exactly to scale. The normal force needs to be a little longer. OK, so then we say, what is it? Ex let's do some of the forces in the y. That's always the quick one. Some of the forces in the y equals 0, because it's not accelerating in the y. Right? So what are the forces in the y? Oh, it's not so quick this time. We have n up. So now we're writing uh, magnitudes, and we're putting in the signs. So the normal force magnitude is up. Uh, and uh, mg is down, but a component of the push force is also down. Right? So we break this into components. You've got one this way and one that way, and since it's 45 degrees, they're both square root of 2 over 2, also known as 1 over the square root of 2. So when I'm trying to write and go fast, I just call it 1 over square root of 2. It's, it's less 2s. Right? So here we have fp over the square root of 2 here. So that means what this is, is we also have, pushing it down, uh, fp over the square root of 2 equals 0. Right. So there, you could say, oh, now I have fp, except, oh, we don't know the normal force. So clearly, we need another, another equation. And clearly, that other equation is in the x. What are the sum of the forces in the x? 0, right? Because it's moving at a constant. The real problem would have said a, a uniform or constant 0.6. So it's moving. It's not accelerating. So it's still equal to 0. So there we have, uh, in the forward direction, we also have a component, fp over the square root of 2, fp over the square root of 2, right? And in the negative direction, we have the force of friction. But let's go ahead, just to speed our lives up here, let's plug in uh, what the force of friction is. It's mu k times the normal force. 
the kinetic friction coefficient times the normal force here in. All right, those have to be equal to zero. All right, so now we have our favorite T2. We have two equations, two unknowns. So there's an unknown FP, and there's an unknown UK. Oh, and, 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 and I'm sorry, not UK, N. <laughs> N is unknown. I gave you UK. All right, there we go. Two equations, two unknowns. I forgot the algebraic fast way to do it. It looks like, of course, I wrote everything completely different from last time. Um, it looks like the quick thing to do that I was saying is solve uh, uh, this for FP, right? And uh, say mu k times n equals f over the square root of 2, right? So here we have um, mu k. I've taken this to the other side here, times the normal force, but I can solve this for the normal force. It's mg plus fp over the square root of 2. Right? So there's just two equations, two unknowns. You can, you can go to sleep and wake up later and watch the rest of the lecture. Okay? So this goes over here. Mu k times n equals fp over the square root of 2, like that. So there, we eliminated n. Thank you. And now we're going to solve for f. p. And we're going to say, OK, this is times mu k. And we take it over there. And uh, we pull the fp out. And what do we get? Uh, that goes over there. 1 over the square root of 2 minus mu k over the square root of 2. Oh, this is not how I did it. Mu k over the square root of 2. So that's that side. And what was left over here? Mm -mm, equals mu k mg. Ah, yes. So in the end, I put a square root of 2 on the top, because I'm just that kind of guy. FP equals, I took this square root of 2 and put it up there. Mu k. Oh, you always put the number in the front. Come on. Style points. Square root of 2. Mu k mg. And what's left in the bottom? 1 minus mu k. 1 minus mu k. There's a completely symbolic expression. <laughs> it's not very pretty. Has nothing to do with energy. This is back to we could have given this a long time ago. This is uh, the F equals ma chapter, the fourth chapter. But you have all these numbers, mu k and the mass and g, and you get 65 newtons. Let's see, how did I mess it up last year? I forgot. I think one of the square root of twos I put in the wrong place. So we're done. No, we're not. What is the power now? This is actually the hard part, right? Now we have the force. Now we know how hard we're pushing down this way. So we can now get the power a couple ways. Um, and they're all the same. All right, we can say, OK, he said, I believe I recall him screaming something about that. So we could say, well, let's actually do the dot product, because we're really into vectors. Right? Everybody's really into vectors, right? OK. Um, Here's how big of vectors I am. I, when I was gone, part of the time I was at my 25th college reunion. It will happen to you, OK? So I was sort of on vacation. And what did I do? I went to a physics class. Yeah, so I got there, and I got to thinking, what am I doing? This is my vacation. Why am I sitting in on this class? I'm so stupid. Um, so I said 65 newtons, All right, times the magnitude of the, this. It was 0.6 meters per second. Oh, you're thinking, that'll never be me. Oh, it'll be you. And then the cosine of the angle between them. Right? The push is this way. And the Oh, may I draw it on the free body diagram? Is that OK? It's not proper. No, I can't. I can't. I can't make myself do it. F push is this way. V is that way. I'm sorry I almost did that. I don't want to upset anyone. So this is 45 degrees. So it's times a cosine of 45 degrees. I like that. All right. So 65 times 0.6 times the square root of 2 over 2 is 27.5 watts. Right. And you say, but that was easy. I want to see a hard one. Why do you always do easy ones? They're easy because I'm doing it. Right? They're not easy. I make it look easy. I've laid this out. I spent two hours laying this out where it would come out in 30 seconds. Okay? That's why it looks easy when I do it. I'm not doing this off the top of my head. I screwed it up last year. That's how hard it is. Okay. It was wrong, completely wrong. I'm going to send an apology to everyone that was emailed. In, I don't know. Okay. So that's, uh, but that's literally, this is all you do. 
Okay? You also could have said, why don't we just take the component of the FP and multiply the component by the velocity? Yes, that's the same thing. That was the second way you could do it. You could essentially say, oh, isn't it? You also said it was F parallel with V. Yeah, F parallel. We already did the cosine there, right? It's square root of 2 over 2. Square root of 2 over 2 equals 1 over the square root of 2. Okay? So that's really how you do these. So these aren't, power problems aren't like super tricky. Okay? If you know how fast it's going, you know what force is pushing it, that's all it is. Okay? Let's see. Okay. Now we're going to talk about something very interesting. Okay? Now we're going to talk about your actual body's energy. So usually when we say body, we don't, like I said the first day, we don't mean your body. We mean like a mass or a boring block or something like that. Now I mean your actual body. Oh, that brings up the questions. <laughs> I have questions about my body. <laughs> Does velocity have to be constant to use the FW equation? No, there's a more general equation when the velocity and the force change, but we don't want to get into that. We're just going to do constant velocity things. We're going to keep it simple. Or not simple, but doable. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, so your actual body. Okay, so... Um, so when we thought about, okay, we raised the block up to some high level and it was, we had energy stored because suddenly we can make it release some energy, right? So I can just stand here and I can start moving around, right? So clearly there's some potential energy. There's a lot of potential energy here, okay? A lot, okay? So you have stored um, potential energy. Maybe I'm made up of small springs and mechanical devices on the inside. Sometimes I wonder. Um, but it's actually in chemical bonds in the crap you eat. The garbage that we eat, somehow your body can still turn into useful things. It's amazing. Just look, just go to the commons and look around. You'll be in awe, okay? C6H2O6, right? Glucose. You could just sit around and eat glucose and see how long that lasts. But what your body does, takes C2H6, whatever the hell it is, glucose, plus oxygen. I know what that is, all right? Carries, oh. Is this bad? I'm going to draw DNA later. Oh, did I screw this up? C2. Oh, I'm missing a wall. Sorry. Oh, my God. So there were two mistakes in last year's lecture. Okay, good. Um, goes to, so your body burns this, right? You breathe in air. It has oxygen in it. Burns this. Gives you, let's all do it together, 6CO2 plus 6H2O plus... Uh, energy, which is like ATP, right? The physics part is that releases energy, and you don't just want it where the oxygen's burned. It makes it into ATP, powerhouse of the cell, some bullshit like that. I don't know, okay? <laughs> and then your cells use the ATP to make things happen, okay? So if we want to do a quick uh, calculation of how this could actually apply, right? So let's imagine we run up the stairs here, All right? So you're here. How we would do a physics calculation. And then you, uh, you run up the stairs, and oh my god, you're tired, right? Okay, right? Run up the stairs. So let's think about what the energy transformation would look like if we wrote it as like in the delta kind of formulas. We'd say the change in energy, and now let's look at all the terms we've learned about. The change in kinetic, change in kinetic energy, plus the change in gravitational potential energy, maybe that's a number, plus the change in spring or elastic potential energy. Certain kind of Nike shoes might have a term there if you compressed and didn't lift up, but probably not. Plus, the change in thermal energy, right? Plus, the change in chemical energy. That's your glucose. You can have all kinds of potentials other than just sort of uh, gravitational and spring. So all I want to do now is run through this process and say, are they zero, positive, or negative? And then you would be able to solve the problem, right? If I asked you, you know, how many joules do you burn going up here, you could probably figure it out, except for the heat part, right? So let's see. We know that if this is an isolated system, let's imagine we're not thinking about anything else, this is zero, right? What's the change in kinetic energy? Zero. But here we go. What's the change in kinetic energy? Zero. Well, that's my zero face. There you go. What's the change in kinetic energy? It's zero because he started from rest, and clearly he's ended at rest, right? Because he's tired. What's the change in gravitational potential energy? Positive. Right. He went upstairs, right? So positive, it would be MGH if this were an actual problem. What's the change in elastic potential energy? 
Ah, but he aged while he went upstairs and the springiness of the collagen in his joints changed. No, let's not do that, okay. It's zero. You don't know about that yet. Um, and then what is the change uh, in thermal energy? So you talked a little about Tuesday. What is he gonna heat up or cool down? He's gonna heat up. So this we would have to give you. In a problem, we would just have to tell you probably that he generated a certain amount of heat. Or maybe in the problem, you would have to solve for how much heat did he make, right? Because that's like there's no formula for that usually for something as complicated as a body. So therefore, what must be the change in the chemical energy? It's positive, positive, it must be negative, right? So the idea here is the energy um, exists in your body. You have a positive high potential energy due to glucose or other chemicals in your body. And when you move around, you burn them. And the change in your potential energy is negative. It doesn't go to zero, hopefully. It's just negative. Okay. All right. So I think the homework has one problem like that, where you work out just some simple numbers. Okay. And these aren't big, complicated physics problems. These are just to get you thinking about this a little bit in the real world, not just masses and springs and friction and you know, all that. That's all the physiology we're going to do today. Oh, wait, no, it isn't. Hold on. What does the word on the left of the stairs say? Hold on. I'll be right back. Oh, you mean on the drawing. No, sorry. That, says a, uh, that says potential energy chemical. That says ATP. I'm not going to try it. And that's negative. Amino triphosphatase potato. Okay. Um, what if the velocity was a diagonal vector and the force was a horizontal vector? Would it still be found using cosine 45? Uh, yes. Because as we talked about last Thursday, dot product commutes. So it doesn't matter which vector you think of first. It's just the angle between them. Make it positive or negative, your calculator will give you the same answer. Okay. Okay, so just as long as we're talking about bodies. Uh, I don't think it's in your book. It's in some other book. Um, about uh, the way you can use this idea to measure how fast you're burning energy with this, right? So pre-instantaneously take in oxygen and immediately turn that into energy. You know, you don't really store a huge amount of oxygen. Well, you store some in your lungs, but that's why, you know, when you have a stress test or whatever, they put that thing on you and it measures exactly how much O2 you're, you're taking in and maybe CO2 out, I don't know. So when they do that, they can measure exactly how long or how much power you're burning. So when you're just sitting still, as you are right now, does anybody know how much power your whole body, endocrine system, everything, your heart, the whole thing? Sounds very complicated. The most impressive computer on earth, in your head, most of us, right? In your head, your heart, just kidding. Your heart, all of this stuff pumping, all this stuff happening. Does anybody want to even throw out, um, want to throw out a number for the number of watts? 1.21 gigawatts. Wait, is that, uh, that's a lightning bolt in Back to the Future, so it's not that high. Anybody have even a smaller number? Zero, not quite. No. Oh yeah, what is it, right? A hundred watts. I find that hard to believe. You're a hundred watt light bulb. That's all you are. It's amazing. But if you do something, if you do something, the, the list I had had typing on here which it said was 125 watts, which I find quite hard to believe. I mean, you would have to type really fast, I think, to get up to 125 watts. So let's ignore that one, but walking, 380 watts. So I'm just giving you orders of magnitude, and then running, uh, 1150 watts. These are obviously averages. Right? So most things you do are in there, between walking and running, and sitting still. So I don't know, I just found that remarkably low because the body is so efficient, right? Interesting. Let's look at this. Now I want you to spend a few seconds thinking about which ones within that, where does that 100 watts uh, come from? Right, oh, your kidneys. Oh, and your liver. Yuck. I have the numbers. Who, who, what do we think is the highest one? I'm going to count to three, and everybody's going to say the one that they think is highest. Think about it for a second. One, two, three. Oh, I heard everything. But the people that said heart were the most uh, enthusiastic. They really thought they had it. The heart is the lowest. Seven watts. It's just a pump, right? I mean, you know, it's just a pump. Uh, next lowest, who thinks, uh, who would guess the next lowest? Pretty obvious the next lowest because it's the least interesting one on there. Kidney, right? Yeah, who cares about the kidney? Eleven watts. 
right? Take something out of your pee, I don't know. Okay. Next one up, muscles. I don't know what this means. All your muscles, 18 watts. Okay, so this is the classic fight here. Your brain or your liver, right? <laughs> this is what you use the most in college, your brain and your liver, right? <laughs> well, it was clearly done on Rice students because the liver wins at 26 watts, right? And the brain is only 19 watts. So there you go. Now you know. The liver. Why the liver? It's a massive chemical. Pl I mean, one, it's big, right? It's the biggest problem. Well, I don't know. It's pretty big. And it's doing a lot of chemical processing. So all you chubbies out there know this is the highest one. OK. All right. Oh, it's going to break down completely even and perfect. Oh, getting all tingly. Um, OK, so that's all I'm going to say about power. All right, so the power problems are pretty straightforward. I think you can do them. F times V. Maybe we'll put in some biological ones because it's fun and you're interested in it. OK. So we had three topics left for energy. One was power. The next one is I promised you, and I don't like to break my promises, I promised you we would get to another kind of collision once we knew that energy was conserved. Right? So there's elastic collisions. OK, so remember back when we did momentum, and we thought about when we ram things into each other and what happens, and you have momentum before, momentum after. And we only did the special kind where they stick together because we had, uh, uh, we had one equation, momentum conservation, and two unknowns, how fast each of them are going. And we couldn't deal with that at the time. But now we have two equations because we have conservation of energy. Right? So let's just set this up. Let's say we've got two things that are going to crash into each other, M1 is going at V1i, and M2 is still. So it's not moving. We're just going to do the case where M2 is not moving. You're welcome. Okay. When you let M2 move, it's still the same ideas. It's just the algebra is really long. So we don't want to do it. So when we're done here, then they collide. And I always draw the colliding part like, woo, like that. And then M1 is moving at V1 final, but M2 clearly has to be moving forward as well. Or maybe M1 would bounce back. But in general, there's some V1 final. Okay? So all we've got to do is set this up and conserve momentum. We know we have to conserve momentum, and we have to conserve energy. Uh, and specifically kinetic energy. We're not giving any mechanism for potential energy here. Okay. So this is good review for the exam. How do we conserve momentum? We say the momentum and in the initial equals the momentum final, right? So M1 V1i initial must equal the sum of these two momentums, M1 V1f plus M2 V2f. So there's an equation. And you see now we're back to having two unknowns. We didn't make them stick together. We said it's two objects that could be going at two different velocities. So that's our two unknowns. But here we have to the rescue coming kinetic energy conservation. One half m1 v1 i squared equals, that's the initial kinetic energy, equals these two. One half m1 v1 f squared plus one half m2 v2 f squared. Ah, so all you got to do is solve that for the two unknowns, V1F and V2F, okay? And it is so hard if you don't know the trick. I have the trick right here. I could say you guys have the rest of the class to solve this, and you would just go in algebraic circles like you would never get there. I mean, you would look it up and do it, right? But if you just start plugging and say, well, I'll solve this V1F, and I'll plug it in here, and then I'll have t two terms, and I'll foil it, and suddenly this will have nine terms, and then I'll stick this here, and then I'll be up to 27 terms, and then we'll just all be crying. Okay? <laughs> so there is a trick. So I don't know what the point of doing the, the trick is. Um, there is a trick. Now let's do the trick. I guess what I want you to see is that uh, sometimes when you have simple equations, it's just because of mathematical luck. It's not that there's anything deep about this. So let me show you the, the trick real quick. Maybe we won't do the whole thing. We'll get it started. Um, what we're going to do is uh, rearrange the K equation. Right? 
in case you become theoretical physicists. Here, I'm teaching you some methods here, right? So when you look at this, you see a bunch of squared terms. You don't want to stick these in here, right? Because that leads to messes. You have the sum of two things, and you square it, it makes a mess. What you want to do is get down to less terms. You want to write them in simpler ways. How could you get rid of squares? Hmm, there's one mathematical rule you learned, probably you guys learned it in third grade, that involves squares, and you want to get rid of these squares. It's not a lathe. Thank you. Machine shop guys, anyone? No. And gals? No. Okay. Uh, squares. What's the difference of two squares? Ah, the difference of two. Yes, thank you. The difference of two squares. So what we could do is rearrange it and say, here we have m1 v1 i squared, and here we have m1 v1 f squared. Ooh, what if we did this? First, let's get rid of the half. Okay, very good. We could say m1 and pull this one over here, and now we have v1 i squared minus v1 f squared. Ooh. Bad ass. And then we say M2 V2 F squared. Okay, it's not necessarily simpler yet. We're getting there. But wait, what is this? This is the difference of two squares. This is equal to M1 times V1 I minus, uh, we'll do the plus first, plus V1 F times V1 I minus V1 F. Does anybody remember that? When you foil that, the cross term goes away. Do, 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 right? So now the squares are gone. Oh, this one's still here. Equals m2 v2 f squared. Okay, so this derivation you don't need. You just need the answer, but it's so much fun that I want us to do it together. And there's a good chance I'll mess it up, and that'll be fun for you. Okay, let's see. All right, so now what are we going to do? Now we're going to come back up here to momentum and say, I bet you I could get something that looks like uh, V1I minus V1F, right? I could get M times V1I minus V1F by pulling those to the left. Is that how I wanted to do it? Oh, no, I did it a different way. Forget about that. I bet you <laughs> I could solve this for V2F, right, and stick it right there. And that's going to have V1I minus V1F in it. That's going to cancel that one. Wow. We are like at the pinnacle of theoretical physics right now, okay? M1, this is what they do 50 years ago. V1i plus V1f. Now they just play doom and uh, say that they're working. V1i minus V1f. I'm sorry, not doom. Uh, something else. Okay, so there's the left side. And now for the right side, I'm going to say M2 and then we're going to say V2F squared, but V2F is um, this over here, 1 over M2. Um, no, I'm sorry, it equals M2 times, yeah, so uh, what am I doing? Oh, we want to plug in for V2, we've got to get this squared, right? So we're going to bring this over here, pull out the M, pull the M2 under it, and square the whole freaking thing, right? So M2, so we ended up with an uh, M1 over M2 squared. Right? That was the, the M parts like that. And then V1F minus V2F squared. That's what we got to do. What a mess. Look at the big, beautiful mess. What can we do now? V1F. Oh, wait. Uh, that's not right. They're both V1s, right? Let's see. So V1I minus V1F. That's what it is. Sorry. V1I minus V1F. I had it completely wrong. Minus v one F, right? Because the point is, uh, that will cancel this one. And now there's no squares anymore. <sighs> thank you, thank you. All the squares are gone, just by this lucky thing that happens when you do the difference of two squares. Look at that. Let's not finish it. Okay, now it's just algebra. But I wanted you to see the fundamental mathematical trick. That was the mathematical trick. So we will take our break, and we come back, and we'll just give you the answer, and we'll get on with our lives. But that was the trick. Very exciting. All right, let's finish off energy. We got to finish it because then we get to move on. Next week is fluids. Ooh, fluids. I lied that mechanics was going to be over after energy. I forgot we have to do fluids. And that's really hard and weird. So the questions I got were all gifts and jokes because this isn't so bad, right? But fluid, you're going to be like, I don't know what's going on. Apparently, it's cold in here. Someone pointed out that it's cold in here. I've never heard that before. <laughs> 
That's a new one. I'll talk to them about heating it up. Um, I'm just kidding. I appreciate the comment. Um, somebody asked about this. Where did this come from? So this was me mentally solving the momentum conservation part for V2F squared in my head and trying to be fast. That's what this is. So go take the momentum conservation equation, solve it for V2F, square it, and you get that. That's where it came from. Okay. But the point is, uh, you know, this is just sort of a detailed derivation. And we could keep going from here, and we could solve this for the unknown V1F. Right? There it is right there, and there it is right there. And that's the thing that we need to know. That will tell us how fast the first mass moves. And I don't want to do it. It's like another board. So let me just give it to you. A V1F. Uh, is it a B-O-A-R-D or a B O R E D? It's both. M1 minus M2 over M1 plus M2 V1I. So if we think of this as the initial velocity, remember the problem that I erased was that we're taking uh, M1 going at V1I and sending it at M2, which is still. So there's only one initial velocity to worry about. Okay? So this tells us what the first mass is going to do. And before we get into what it means, let's look at what the second mass is going to do. V to final, how fast the still mass ends up moving, is 2 m1, right? Yeah, m1, over m1 plus m2. Times that same V1 initial. There you go. So that's the solution. If you solve that for V1i and then plug it back in the other equation to get V2f uh, in addition. Okay, so that's an elastic, that is, okay, so there's a dangerous thing about English language. That is an elastic collision. That is an elastic collision. That is not an inelastic collision. So you see, that's hard to say. That is an elastic collision, okay? So what that means is, let's look at it, and let's look at the three limiting cases of this collision. Let's say that uh, a little mass is bouncing off of a big mass, like that. Right, so this would look something like this. Right, there's M1 and it's moving along, and M2 is sitting here still. So we could we'll use our intuition to guess what's going to happen. Oh, wow, the posters were so popular, I did not know. I will be back on the poster soon. Do, 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 do. What's going to happen? Uh, one hits two, the mass one is less than mass two. What's going to happen is they're going to collide. Boom. And then mass 2 is going to move, and mass 1 is going to move. But let's look at how. Uh, mass 1 is going to move like this. If m1 is smaller than m2, this number is going to be negative. Right? These are vector components now. Because we were doing this as components, because we don't know which way it's going to go. So we didn't do a magnitude and a sign. It's a component. And since the component came out negative, that means it goes backwards. So if m1 is smaller than m2, this goes back like this. Woo, like that. Because it has to be that this will give you a negative number, and this has to give you a positive number. And by definition, this was forward. This was positive. So you could say it changes direction. If you say, well, maybe this was negative. It changes direction. Right? If you call this negative, then this would make the answer positive. So the light mass will always bounce back, is the answer, in this elastic collision. Uh, let's look at this one. The heavy mass can only go the same direction, can only go forward. Now, there's no way you combine this to get a negative number. 2m1 is positive. The sum is positive. V1i, you're defining the initial direction as positive. So it must go like this. Right. Probably doesn't go as fast because it's bigger, and we have to conserve momentum. Okay? So that process will conserve both momentum and energy. Now, you might say, wait, you have some momentum going the wrong way, so you're losing a lot of momentum on mass 1, but you're gaining a lot on mass 2, right? Because it originally had 0, and now suddenly it's creating some momentum to the right. In the end, it all balances. So we can see if that's the case. So here is two things that go, undergo an, an elastic collision because one of them has a spring on it. And since it has a spring on it, it weighs more. So that's why these masses are here. Okay. So I want it to weigh a lot more. So I'm going to get like my Harvard book here, my one kilogram weight. Oh, no, I want it to weigh less. So I'm going to put my Harvard book here and my one kilogram weight. Did you know I have a book from Harvard in my library? Does everybody know that? You know. You know, that's just how we roll at Jones, you know. <laughs> Five-foot bookshelves, you know. Okay, so here we go. So light mass hits heavy mass. 
if it goes forward, then I'll retire. Right, instantly, I'll walk out the door. <laughs> that was close, okay. <laughs> right, so it bounced back. It bounced back, let's do it again. And if I send it fast, it doesn't matter. It always bounces back. If I send it slow, like the, vo the velocity doesn't matter. It's just the relative masses that matter. If I send it slow, just uh, right. There's nothing I can do to make this go forward if it weighs less, according to that equation. Okay? The one way would be if this didn't start at rest. If this were moving, you get all kinds of answers. But if this were moving, there would be like a second term here and a second term here. And it would take multiple boards. Right? So in this class, we're just going to do the elastic collision where this one starts out still. And then it's this relatively simple answer. Okay? So that, get that in your head. That's like an intuition thing to have in your head. Two things collide. Most collisions are elastic if they bounce off of each other. The light one will always bounce back, according to those equations. What if they're equal? Right? What if m1 equals m2? Look at the equations and make a prediction. So this will make them equal. What's going to happen? Oh, I'm so excited. What's it going to do? Do, do, do? You better decide quick, because I can't wait any longer. Here we go. So this is equal. This mass just makes up for the spring mechanism. Hey, one stops, so mass one stops, and mass two goes at the same speed. Very fun. Mass one stops, same speed. Because m1 minus m2 is zero. Right? And 2m over m1 plus m2 is what? One. Right? So this one takes off at the same speed this one was at, because we have to conserve momentum. If this one's going to stop and they have the same mass, they basically just exchange velocities. Right? So one fun peculiarity about the case where they're both moving is that all they really do is exchange velocities. We're not doing the equations to prove it, but if I like have this one slow and this one fast and it's going to hit it, it's the same result. They just exchange velocities. Like, watch this. Well, that's not a good example of the one going fast. Here's going slow and this one's fast. See how they just exchange. This one became fast, this one became slow. If they're going at each other, right, they exchange velocities. But for your stationary case, it's also true. They exchange velocities. This one stops and this one keeps going. Oh, no. The spring, it missed the spring. And I didn't make my retire statement on that one. There we go. Okay, and then the final case. All right, so M1 equals M2. Uh, what happens? They're the same. This one here, they hit. Oh my God. And then this one stops. And this one keeps going. All right. And then the third case to have in your head is uh, obviously M1 greater than M2. All right. M1 greater than M2, which is like this. One uh, hits the Prius over here. Two, that's still. Then they hit. Big mass to mass. And now M1 is just going to barrel through M2 if we look at the equations. right? If M1 is bigger than M2, then that's positive. So it keeps going forward. This one goes faster. Obviously, it has to go faster. So they can't go into each other. So let's see. So that's why if I put the mass here like that, and make it heavier. It should just kind of barrel through and keep going forward, and they'll both go forward. There we go, right? So all makes perfect sense based on uh, simple equations, okay? So I could imagine it'd be fun on an exam to make up some conceptual question about masses hitting each other, but we'll probably have like five masses or something. You know? <laughs> mass after mass after mass, and have to keep up with it. I don't know. We'll think of something. Um, so let's look at a few examples of uh, using this in problems. So the thing to keep in mind, just for homework, and the, the, the general idea I want you to know is, uh, you know, consider it a 1D collision in the moment. So often we'll give it some more interesting physical thing happening than just that because we're done. I mean, we've done the three problems. There's really nothing we can do. But for example, in your homework, there's one like this. There's sort of like always uh, Rube, let's see, what is it? Rube Goldberg, is that the word? Rude Goldberg? I don't know. Where you've got a mass on a frictionless surface like this, and then you've got like a string and another mass like this, right? One and two. And what's going to happen? Oh, it's going to swing. And we always have them set up where right when they hit, it's basically a 1D problem. So we could tell you this is going to end up being an elastic collision, or an inelastic collision, really. And we could say what happens right after they hit. Right? 
So what you do is you get the speed of this thing once it gets here, and then just treat it like one of these, right? They hit. If this one weighs less, it bounces back. This one goes forward. And then once they've got their velocity from the collision, then you can do energy or kinematics again, okay? But if you see something like curved and you think, I don't know how to do a curved collision, it's really just the 1D collision. And just at the moment, you think of it as, as 1D. So another example of the same thing would be like if you had a curved track and you had a mass here and you had a mass here, it's going to slide down. By the time it gets here, it's going to have some velocity that you could calculate. And it's just a 1D collision. Okay? So look for ways to use them. Oh, I have one more just while we're drawing everything we can think of off the top of our head while we're eating breakfast is um, a ball comes up and oh, up here on the hill, there's another ball and it's gonna hit that ball, boom. If it hits it right when it's horizontal, it's a 1D collision at that moment. And then you can do fun things like, well, if it rebounds at a different speed, it's not gonna fall at the same place, right? How would you catch it? Complicated beer pong or something. So that's how you use uh, those equations, okay? So now the two fundamental ones you know, you know one where one is still this one is moving, and it's elastic. And you know the one where they stick together, and that's perfectly inelastic. That's the two we did, OK? OK. Whew. Let's take a five minute, a little, a little mental, mental chill out, because we're going to change topics. And the CTE told me that we've got to stop every few minutes. And I said, do demos count? And they said, yeah. So like, well, thank God, because I'm not stopping for any other reason. But now we're just stopping for fun. Or we could keep going and finish early. Let's see. <laughs> uh, CT hasn't studied that. Let's see. All right. So the last thing we're going to talk about for energy is energy diagrams, because this is the one thing that you might actually like need um, in your life here as we go forward. So let's look at this is like a general thing that is used in a lot of fields. So let's look at one energy diagram. Important tool. for, I would say, visualizing, but you can actually get math out of them, which you'll do on the homework, for visualizing interactions. Mostly like molecular kind of interactions. Right. So let's see. I don't know. Let's see. Oh, is the third scenario, what is happening? <laughs> this isn't clear. What? Oh, this is like the cannon shooting the cannonball, you know, like a trajectory. And at the top of the trajectory, it hits another cannonball. Oh, these are different cannonballs. Here you go. That's never happened to you? <laughs> Two cannonballs on the hill? OK, so visualize, So first, let's, let's get an interaction going here. Oh, yes. How about one of these? A mass and a spring moving along an axis starting at 0 at the natural length. So there it's just a happy mass and a spring. Like that, like this, except this one's upright. We can pretend there's no gravity. OK, right, so we can move it up and down. So right now it's at rest. Net force is 0, because this little bit of a stretch we get cancels gravity. So pretend there's no gravity, and this is the natural length. And we're all like, what? You? Right, so that's what it's like. OK, so now what we're going to do, all we got to do to do an energy diagram is plot the spring potential energy. We can do that, right, as a function of position. So here, we're going to say x is up. I can't do it sideways because I have to get an air track, and it's very loud. Right, so I pull down, the potential energy increases. And if I push up, the potential energy increases. Right? Either way you go, if you pull down, you put in energy because the spring wants to pull it back because you extended the spring. If you push up, you put in energy because the spring wants to push it down. Because remember, what was the equation for us? It was 1 half kx squared. Remember, the spring kinetic uh, potential energy was 1 half kx squared. So all really asking you to do is plot 1 half kx squared. So I can do that. x squared looks like this, uh, like that. You can even make the noise. Oh, that's not very good. Well, it's good enough. You can make the noise. You can make the chalk make the noise. Potential energy diagram, there it is. What was I gonna do with this? Okay, oh yeah, now, imagine a mass moving on a spring at some energy. Hey, these notes are like useful. I should just use these sometimes. Now imagine a mass moving on a spring at some energy. How to represent this? All right, so now the mass, now we're gonna make it move. 
moving, right? Back and forth. So uh, you would say, well, you've got to think about the turning points, really. So in an oscillator, we'll talk about oscillators more at the end, but it's really the turning points are the interesting part. Right? The turning points is when it stops. You know, it's moving up and down, and the lowest it goes right now, right? Right here. Right here. And then up at the top. Those are turning points. So turning points, it's not moving, so it has no kinetic energy. Ah. Turning points, we could say V equals zero, so therefore K equals zero. So that's when it's going to be at its maximum uh, kinetic energy. That's also for the spring when it's at its maximum displacement. So you could say this is probably a turning point right here. Right? So the thing moves out to x, and then it becomes all, all potential. And then as it moves back, I could draw a line like that, and it's going to get to here, the same point on the other side. Right? But as it moves through, what does it do? Here it's stopped, v equals 0, k equals 0. That's a turning point. But here, what's it doing? Here, it's moving. So here, it's like flying this way. Or if it came from there, it's flying that way. So here, and what's the u spring is 0? It's the maximum kinetic energy, because it's the maximum velocity. So it's like it's just going back and forth through this potential energy diagram. It's really moving in 1D. But if you think about this diagram, it's kind of like it's following uh, the potential energy curve like that. And how high it is on the curve is how much potential energy it has. But what's this? This is the total mechanical energy right here. Is this line, right? Its total is its maximum uh, 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 potential here, its maximum here. We could draw the line all the way across. And then you could even pick a point and say, well, how does it break down here? Well, here you would say this bar is its kinetic because this bar is its potential. Right? So this is how high it is in potential. I mean, it's not an area. I'm just trying to make it easier to see. It has this much potential. Therefore, it has to have this much kinetic. So when you're all the way over here, it's all kinetic, isn't it? Look at that. Just like we said, all kinetic. What about when you're right here? Oh, there's hardly any kinetic left. Right? There's just a little bit of kinetic and a lot of potential. So all it's doing is exchanging kinetic for potential as it bounces around back and forth in there. Right? Moving around in a potential energy diagram. So it's really a plot of the potential, but you can think about both. You can think about potential and kinetic. OK, now we want to get really weird. OK, it's going to get messy on this diagram. You may not want to do this. I don't know if you can handle it. But what I'm going to do now is plot the kinetic energy on top of the potential energy diagram. It's OK. All right, so I'm going to start here, and it looks like this. It's like the upside down version. All right? So that way, the sum of these two is always a constant. That's like what a parabola is or something. Okay? So when you're here, <coughs> you're all kinetic. That's why the kinetic is all the way up to the energy line. When you're here, you're all potential. That's why the kinetic has made it to zero. Okay? So now you completely understand everything you could possibly do with that. Um, and one thing I'll say about these diagrams is the way people physically think about them, like even though this represents a spring and a mass, and the only potential is a spring, the common way to think about them is as though this is a surface and you're thinking about gravitational field near the Earth pulling things down. That's kind of the way to think about it. And it always, you know, well, OK, in classical systems, it always works. In quantum systems, other things happen. But if you said, what would happen to a ball? If this were a ball in a bowl, what would it do? It would do exactly what the mass in the spring is doing. You'd have it up here. It's all gravitational potential. You'd release it, and it would flow down here. It'd be all kinetic here. Gravitational potential is gone. And it would come up here and be all potential again. And it would just roll back and forth. Right? The ball would go back and forth, just like the mass goes up and down. So when you're looking at one, when you want to intuit what's going to happen, just think of it as a solid surface and think of what gravity would do to a ball. And that's pretty much the right interpretation of it. Okay? Even if it's like a molecular bond or something. Let's see. So let's look at what we can do with this here. Um, Let's see. So like one thing you get out of this is something called an energy landscape. And this is where physicists get real nonspecific about things. So here I was being real specific. That's the mechanical energy of a mass and a spring, and that's x. OK? Get ready, because a physicist will go, energy landscape. Done. Right? That's an energy landscape. Physicists won't even put any axes on it. 
OK, if you have to have an axis, OK. Well, duh, this is energy. It's an energy landscape. Oh, you have to do a problem? OK, well, here's some units. There's 0, 1 EV, 2 EV, 3 EV, 4 EV. OK, fine. All right? And now you probably want an x-axis, don't you? Pfft, forget it. We're not giving you an x-axis. We don't put x-axis on things. What are you talking about? So this could be where something is moving in x. This could be the stretch of a bond. We usually call it like a generalized coordinate, and we don't worry about what it is. It's too complicated. We can't get bothered with that. Okay? So here it was literally the position of the ball. Here it could be many things. But just to be kind, I will make it the position of an electron. There we go. So now it's something physical. I'm just warning you, you may see, like in a book, you may just see this, or maybe you'll see this. And then you'll wonder what this is. It's usually a stretching bond in a chemical system. Okay. Are this week's lectures on the exam? Yes. So the exam is momentum and energy, but not fluids. So not next week's. Okay, so the things we can learn about this is this ball could be in one of two stable states, right? If you let it roll all day and eventually stop, it's either going to stop here uh, at A or it's going to stop here at B, right? It's going to be at one or the other. Not moving. And if you were to start getting it moving, it's just like the mass in the spring. When it's trapped in here, just moving with, say, this much energy, it's just bouncing back and forth on whatever this coordinate is. And so it's trapped in this well, just like a ball would be trapped if this were a hill. Right? If the ball is just rolling like this, it has this much energy. Okay? Is it going to get over the hill? No, it's not going to get over the hill. What if I give it this much energy? Is it going to get over the hill? No, it'll never get over because this is the turning point. It'll only get up to the turning point. La, la, la. What about here? No. How much energy to get over the hill? This much. What if I need a number? It's this much. Right? That difference, about an EV. So if the ball is sitting in a well that's about an EV to this uh, barrier, if you give it more than an EV, then it'll fall down here. So if I say, what's the energy to get from, if you're, if you're at the bottom of the well in A, how much energy do you need to make it to B? The answer is the height of this. And rather than having to think about quantum mechanics, you can just think of it as a ball rolling around in a hill. Now, if I give it enough energy to get to B, what's it going to do? Is it just going to sit there? Nope. So there's no friction. It'll say, woo, whoa, all right. And it'll come all the way back down to A, and it'll get back up to here. Now, if it's a real system that's friction and radiating and all kinds of stuff happens, it'll really just eventually make its way back down to B. Right. So one kind of question would be, yeah, the energy to get from A to B, um, that's really it, yeah. <laughs> or another question might be, here's a bunch of points. Where do I need to start it over here to make it to there? And the answer would be, whichever one is above this barrier. Right. So you could do that whole thing without knowing what this axis is. Because often the questions are just about the energy, or whatever physical thing you're trying to do is just about the energy. Okay, so watch for those. Um, <clears throat> and then I want to show you that this idea is basically what a chemical bond is. Okay. This is all related to chemical bonds. <clears throat> uh, let's see. So now we're going to do chemistry that's slightly more in my area of authority than, than ATP and glucose here. Slightly. So say we have, uh, here's a complicated molecule where A is going to pond to B. There's a physicist molecule. Okay, I gave you two bodies. That's already like massively complicated. And let's think about what happens. We're going to say this is fixed at the origin, and this one moves in X. Okay? Now normally, like I said, we wouldn't give you the horizontal axis. But here, it's your first one. We'll give you the horizontal axis. Okay? And we just have to think about what interactions happen when these two things start to get close to each other here. Let's see. So let's draw the energy. Often we don't use U, we just say it's the energy. We don't need to call it a potential. It's just the energy. And we say, OK, here is the axis for moving A and B around. And when they're really far from each other, there's no potential. Say they don't interact. right? If they're a mile apart, there's not going to be any potential or any energy uh, difference between them. But if they uh, start to get close to each other, they're going to be attracted to each other like this. Now, why are they going to be attracted to each other? Well, it depends on what they are and what kind of a bond we're making. Right? So if we're just going to make some van der Waals, DLVO, whatever force, it'd be easy to explain. But if we're going to make a chemical bond, like a covalent bond, why do they stick together in a covalent bond? Right? It's the force F 
F complete shell. There's freshman physics chemistry right there. All right. They want to complete the shell, the valence, yada, yada, yada. Some quantum mechanical force is making that want to happen. Right? Is this what scalar teaching with scalar is? I don't know. Okay. So that would, then you'd say, well, then why don't all the atoms in the world stick together? Oh, they don't, because there's another uh, interaction. See, I wrote a force here, right? I didn't write an energy. There you go. In physics, we don't worry about the difference. One, same thing. Force, energy, same thing. Right? So what about this? But what if they get too close? Ah. This is the energy of the poly exclusion principle. Also quantum mechanics stuff. Two quantum particles can't exist in the same state at the same time. And if you try to force them to, they'll push back really hard. Right? Again, quantum forces really electromagnetic forces. But then the question is, what happens when you add these? So when you have a bunch of energy diagrams and you want the total, you just add them. Right? So if I add those, what do they look like? Uh, far away, nothing's happening. And then for a while, it really wants to complete the shell, but it gets too close, whoa, like that. Whoa, like that. And we're, okay, so now if I'm, gonna, if I'm at atom B, where am I gonna go? Once atomic friction sets in, I'm gonna land right here, right? So this is the bond length right here. That's how long the bond is. Because the origin was a position of A, and this is where B goes, so that's the bond, right? So here's the origin, like that. So you can do this for lots of different, this is sort of just pretend chemical bonding forces and interactions. You can do it for others. And now I realize I, I missed a page. Yeah, let me tell you one thing real fast. You need it for the homework. Okay, sorry. Did it not print? Let's see, where is it? I missed a page. It's the calculus, oh, the calculus of energy diagrams. This was the best one. It's the calculus of energy diagrams. I can do it in like two minutes, and we have five left, so, you know. Okay, it just is totally messing up my flow here, you know. We were supposed to end on chemical bonds to like roaring applause, and everybody goes out high-fiving. And now we're ending on calculus. Oh, well. You lose some, you lose some when you teach intro physics. Um, is the bond, yeah, so the bond length, so my drawing went to crap here. The bond length is this physical distance in X. It's like I'm saying that the ball ends up at the bottom of this well, and how far is it from the origin, right? I put this at the origin, and this was moving around in X. So it's just how far apart they are. Okay, so then the final, the exciting part, is the calculus of energy diagrams. Okay, so we know that the change in potential, we've been plotting the potential, is the external work that you do. So we talked about that earlier. You do work on something, you lift it up in the air and you put it on a shelf. You did work to increase its gravitational potential. But we know the work is the integral of the force you applied over some distance, right? So this looks like the fundamental theorem of calculus. The integral of this equals u final minus u initial. Remember the fundamental theorem of calculus? If this was uh, the change in position, it's the integral of the velocity times time. Well, now we have the change in uh, of energy of the integral of the force times position. That means we can rewrite it the other way. We can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus and get that the force is um, the negative du dx. All right. I forgot to think about and explain where the negative comes from. It's because whether it's external work or internal don't worry about it. Just accept for now, we will talk about the negative sign in office hours, that the force is negative du dx. So let's look real quick what that means. All that means, and to use it mathematically, is anywhere you go on this slope or on this curve, if you want to know the force that the ball is actually feeling, you just take the derivative of whatever is making the potential. So here would be the force is the negative derivative of 1 half kx squared. Okay. Negative, one-half kx squared, the derivative is kx. It's Hooke's law, right? So any potential I give you, say if I give you the potential is 3 plus 12 squared plus x squared plus x to the 10th. And you'd say, I need a, for a function for the force. What is it? Minus 2x minus 10x to the 9. Just take the derivative and make it negative, okay? And then you have the force anywhere you go, okay? But that's just straight from, that's just sort of the definition of the relationship between force, work, and energy is that it looks like calculus. It is calculus, okay? Okay, so that was not in the right place 
whatever.